the clip you just watched was um, from a movie that was released in 2010, and it depicted uh, this particular scene was the Passchendaele battle. And uh, in that battle, that's one single battle, 850,000 men were killed. Luke 6, verses 27 to 36 says, Jesus speaking, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other side also. If someone takes your cloak, Do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who only love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is it that you would do good to them? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. I've been a Mennonite brother and pastor for about 18 years, and I am a pacifist. And I have battled in my own spirit with men going to war and understanding the depth of what it means to be a pacifist. But something came into focus to me a number of years ago with South Africa and how I spoke to a man who told me about what it means to be a peacekeeper. And that meant that he, along with his friends, mostly women of men who had been killed, would go into these battles that happened in South Africa where two competing provinces were set up to hate each other by the apartheid government and they would go willingly to kill each other because this apartheid government had stirred up evil in their hearts. And as they stood about to fight, these these women, mostly mothers and wives of people that had been lost, would stand before the guns and throw a soccer ball in the middle and pray for them, and they would watch as these opposing forces would look at each other and stop seeing villains and stop seeing an enemy, and they would see a person, and they would settle their differences with a game of soccer instead of killing each other. I asked the question, Do godly men and women ever go to war? Is there ever anything worth fighting for? Last week, I spoke to a retired soldier. And he told me that there is no glory in war. And that any really good soldier never really wants to go to war. Not necessarily because a good soldier doesn't want to be shot or even die. No, A good soldier values life. He said something like this. A good soldier has the heart to preserve life and will sacrifice his or own life to that end. A good soldier loves life and will give up their own life to preserve that. It is not the desire for battle that makes a good soldier. Rather, it is the love of life 
that compels a good soldier to lay his or her life down. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his his Son into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Why do godly men and women sometimes have to go to war? Edmund Burke once said, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. That as a pacifist, I fully understand the depth of that hard decision that it takes for godly men to stand up and be counted, even if it means it costs them something. Micah 6 8 says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Those are words of a pacifist. Those are words of God who knows full well what it costs to lay your life down so that somebody else can live. That Jesus Christ came to this earth, Son of God, to lay his life down so that we could live. Edmund Burke knew this when he wrote, all that it takes for evil to prevail is for godly men to do nothing. Why godly men and women must sometimes go to war. Martin Niemöller was a German U-boat captain. He retired just prior to the Second World War starting. And if you know your history, you know that the Treaty of Versailles called upon war reparations made by Germany that were oppressive that Germany had to pay back for having lost World War I. And the country was plunged into into poverty. And many were angry and wanted to be free from having to pay back that debt. The country was bankrupt and demoralized. And from that came the rise of their own savior, Adolf Hitler, who started to rebuild the country from the inside out. And to Pastor Niemöller, or Martin Niemöller, he was uh, at one time a great advocate of Adolf Hitler. But when he started to see anti-Semitism and he started to see hatred and violence come from inside him, he went to seminary and he became a pastor. And he joined the theologians, the ranks of Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, many of you know those names. And he started to fight against Hitler's plans. And in the middle of the rise of Nazism, Pastor Niemöller wrote these words. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, a Protestant, and there was no one left to speak out for me. All it takes for evil to prevail is for godly men to do nothing. By the end of the Second World War, 10 million Jews and gypsies 
were killed in labor and concentration camps. The final solution. They blamed the Jews for all the ills that had fallen upon Germany. It was a big lie, but many people bought into it. And so you can imagine that a population of 10 times the size of Saskatchewan died at the hands of the Nazis. Godly men and women sometimes have to love mercy and to love justice and to be the kind of pacifists that are willing to stand up and be counted. They're the kind of pacifists that not only have to throw a soccer ball into the center of competing forces, but they may have to pick up a weapon. Contradiction in terms, perhaps. But to love mercy, to love justice, to stand up for those the widows and orphans, those who are being persecuted, those who are being killed and slaughtered. Ten million Jews and gypsies were killed by the end of the Second World War. A good soldier values life to the degree that he's willing to lay his own life down. There is no glory in war. In 1917, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, maybe Canada's most famous battle, they took a ridge that was declared to be untakeable, where thousands had died. They took the ridge. In the middle of the battle, On Christmas Eve, rain and mud and blood and gunshots and heavy artillery. The noise was deafening. And the reports have it that at some time during those wee hours of the morning on Christmas Eve, somebody heard a German singing Christmas carols on the other side. And then the Canadians and the Brits and the Australians, they started to sing Christmas carols. And one by one, the the guns stopped firing and the noise of the artillery became the background, and it was the sound of the Christmas carols that started to carry out over the battlefield. And they put their guns down. And the two opposing forces met in the middle, and they had a church service, and they started to bury their dead. And they shared gifts with each other. And they ate Christmas dinner with each other. And they prayed with each other. I found a letter written by one of the Canadian soldiers who was there. And he wrote this letter back to his family. Let me read the letter to you. I must say, I spent a merrier Christmas in the trenches than I had expected. There was a truce for a while that we could go and bury our dead. After we had a short service over the graves, the chaplain read the 23rd Psalm and the German chaplain read it in German. It seemed queer to us as we lined up on either side of the graves, Germans on one side, British on the other. After the service, the Germans asked if we would not shoot for a day or even the day after. We were speaking to the Germans and got souvenirs from them. I got a little box of ground coffee so that I had coffee for breakfast that morning. We also got nuts and sweets and chocolates from them. The Germans seemed to be better off than us. They had plenty of cigarettes and tobacco, and we also got some of them. 
You will hardly credit this, but it's truth. Fancy shooting at them and then going over and wishing them a Merry Christmas. I don't think this will ever happen again in the world's history. You would have thought that this was a place that had been declared that there was no shooting on Christmas Day or the day after. I'm enclosing a small piece of ribbon that I got from one of the German soldiers. One of the chaps got a helmet. Remember me at home in the new year. In those wars, there were Christians on both sides. You know, I studied political science in university for four years, and I don't think today we have a clear understanding of why World War I happened. But we know that at Vimy Ridge, they found peace for a day and a half. That in Passchendaele, 850,000 men were killed. Edmund Burke wrote, All it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. God tells us, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I just wanted to add one little thing is that in our world today is becoming more difficult to be a Christian. <laughs> that our battle lines are not with flesh and blood, but the principalities, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's becoming less popular for you as a believer to speak up for your faith, that you may be persecuted or harmed. Maybe not in the way they are in third world countries where it could cost you your life. But there are other ways where you're made to feel bad or your job may be threatened. In Winnipeg, our police chief recently just received great harm because he's a believer and he chose to speak out for his faith. You may have jobs where it's inappropriate for you to share your faith. You might not even be able to be a Christian if they knew you could possibly lose your job. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, but the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. That when we understand the depth of what soldiers who must physically do battle to lay their lives down for us, I suppose it wouldn't be inappropriate to include ourselves if we are Christian soldiers. If we choose to live our faith boldly in the faith in the face of a world that does not appreciate us or care about us. That all it takes for evil to prevail is for us to be a frog in the kettle when we don't speak up until it's too late, like Pastor Mueller, who for a moment was a Nazi. But then he chose to speak up. And many of you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his life died in a concentration camp. All it takes for evil to prevail is for godly men to do nothing. Lord, I want to pray for the men and women in our armed forces who every time they put their uniform on, it could be for the last time. They have chosen to defend and to protect us. They are the peacemakers that make it possible for us to be in this room today worshiping you freely. That had the Nazis won 60 years ago, we would not have that freedom today. But Lord, I am aware today that there are pressures on us as believers that are every bit as severe that challenges to us to stand up and be counted where it's politically incorrect, even financially costly. Lord, please give us the courage to speak up when we must. We don't want to wait till it's too late. Bless the soldiers who have on the khakis and the uniforms. 
But Lord, I'm also asking you this day to bless those of us who show up to work every day and have to live our faith that we don't do so silently, that we do so with courage. And we can say that if the Lord is for us, Hebrews 13, 6, who can possibly stand against us? In Jesus' name, amen.